20 spots on the two spots. I saw it go in. I just have to write this all down. I got it. How long? You know, how long is it going to take? I get two minutes. All right. Okay. We're going to call the meeting to order. First item is a roll call. Diane. Mayor Skoog. Present. Councilmember Anderson. Here. Councilmember Grossman. I'm here. Councilmember Mallory is absent this evening. Vice Mayor Nye. Here. Councilmember Whiting. Here. And Councilmember Rooney. Here. We have a quorum there. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> okay, next item is discussion with legislators. And I think just to, I know that um, Representative Stringer has got to uh, another, uh, has another con our conflicting event. So we're going to start with him maybe. You're going to give a couple of uh, a short presentation. David, you're on. Thank you. Uh, no. Is this a live one? It's supposed to be live. Where's uh, Brian? Is it live? Keep talking. Not yet. All right, I can hear myself. Yeah, there it works. <laughs> I can hear myself, so I know we're good. Uh, so let me just uh, talk a little bit about, um, as you all know, I'm, I'm still a freshman. I've actually, uh, feels like forever, but I've actually only been down there since January of this year. So it's not even a year yet that I've been in the state legislature. And uh, we had a pretty productive uh, term, I would say, all three of us. Uh, we got sort of the major priorities done. I don't want to steal anybody's thunder here, but uh, we, did, we did get money from uh, HERF back. Um, we, did, uh, we did get the lottery money back for Yavapai County. And uh, what was the other one? The, uh, the Juvenile Detention Center. We, 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 got, uh, we reduced our, our contribution to the Juvenile Detention uh, uh, Center, the state center. So, so those were the three priorities that uh, we, we started with. Um, my priorities maybe are a little different from some of my colleagues, and the reason for that is because of my background and because of the committees I serve on. I serve on the Education Committee. I serve on the Judiciary Committee. I'm an attorney, so I'm on the Judiciary Committee. And I serve on the Committee for Federalism and States' Rights. So the kind of legislation that I follow most closely and that I get most involved with are, are things relating to those subject matter areas. So one of the things that I'm going to be working on again this year uh, is trying to preserve the ESA. We passed the ESA, the uh, Empowerment Scholarship Account, uh, a scholarship account, and that's a very big thing to the governor, and it's a, something I have a personal uh, interest in. And uh, we did pass it, passed it very narrow, narrowly. It's going to be on the ballot. But that's an area the, on the Education Committee I'm very concerned about preserving the ESA. I'm also very concerned about school funding. And uh, I do come down on the side of uh, increasing teacher pay. So that's going to be a priority of mine this year is try to get more money uh, for teachers uh, out of our state legislature. Uh, on the area of uh, uh, the Judiciary Committee and public safety, uh, I have a press release coming out next week. I have organized uh, a criminal study group on criminal justice reform. And this study group is going to be working on uh, uh, the problem of over-incarceration in the state of Arizona. The state of Arizona has the seventh highest incarceration rate in the United States. Uh, you have to go to the Deep South to find an incarceration rate higher than the state of Arizona. We also have one of the highest recidivism rates uh, in the United States. Uh, we spend about uh, over 10 percent of our budget. It's over a billion dollars a year that we spend on, on uh, corrections and public safety. So we're spending a tremendous amount, investing a tremendous amount of resources in this. It costs the uh, county governments and the local governments a lot of money to, uh, to uh, uh, lock people up and to incarcerate them. So some reform issues. Uh, it's going to have a, be a bipartisan committee on criminal justice reform, and our goal is to reduce recidivism, to promote rehabilitation, and to lower the cost to the government of incarcerating people. So that's going to be a big priority of mine uh, this year. And uh, on the federalism side, again, we're going to be working, uh, hoping Arizona, actually Arizona already has uh, passed a resolution on the ballot's budget. Uh, I think things of that nature will be coming up again. Uh, I am sort of a state's right states' rights uh, proponent. Uh, I, I support the sovereignty of, of Arizona, and uh, those are some of the issues I'm going to be working on. So with that, any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Let's go to um, Representative Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 
I'll kind of take these in order, but uh, I might have to jump around a little bit. Uh, wh what are the legislative priorities uh, for the next session? Well, for me, uh, I'm the chairman of the Transportation Committee, so um, I'm looking at ways to stop the raid on the Highway User Fund, the HERF Fund. As you know, every year at the middle of the night at 3 a.m., they'll present this little budget blurb that has a one-liner in it that says notwithstanding. The Department of Public Safety by statute is allowed to take $10 million from the HERF, and the State Highway Fund is allowed to take $10 million from the HERF. But that's not what happens, because at 3 a.m. in the morning, with the little budget blurb, and they, they basically nullify the law, the statute, by saying notwithstanding the statutory requirement of only $10 million, they remove that, and then they take whatever amount of money they need, and generally it's around $100 million, could be as high as 120. Sometimes, uh, last year it was $90 million. They take it out of the Highway Users Fund. So we have got to get a way to fund the Department of Public Safety out of sweeping the HERF because the citizens know that when they pay their gas tax or diesel tax and the money goes into the fund, they know, they're smart enough to know that not all that money comes back in, for roads and bridges and infrastructure because they have to find, defi, uh, fund the Department of Public Safety. So I have a bill, as I did last year, to get the Department of Public Safety out of the HERF, and it's going to be called a highway safety fee. It's not going to be a tax. It's going to be a fee set by the director of ADOT that will fund up to 110% of the DPS budget. And this fee will be through uh, vehicle registration on a yearly basis. So every citizen that registers a car or a vehicle or a motorcycle will contribute a small amount to the fund for the Department of Public Safety. That has to happen. We have to get DPS out of the Highway User Fund. And then along with that, there's several other issues in transportation that need to be directed, uh, I'm looking at. One is uh, the ability uh, to look at revenue sources for alternate fuels that are not being taxed right now, that is natural gas. As you may know, the trucking industry is going to natural gas. And uh, it, right now, there'd be no tax at all on natural gas. And the trucking industry is in support of uh, having that looked at. I mean, they're not opposed to it. They know they can't use the roads in Arizona for free. But if they're going to go to a product that's not taxed, we need, need to seriously look at that. Along with electric vehicles, we need to look at those. And we also are looking at uh, removing the alternate uh, vehicles, fuel vehicles, uh, credit for uh, vehicle license tax. Right now, when you buy an electric car or something, you get a, a, a break from your registration. That's got to end, because that was instituted years ago, and there's no reason to keep it in, in place. We need the revenue to apply to the HERF so we can do the things we need to do. Um, so those are my transportation priorities. I'm also working with the sober living home industry, as I did in Prescott. We have the state on board now. Finally, Governor Ducey has directed the Department of, Pub of uh, Public uh, Department of Health Services to cooperate and come up with a solution for these sober living homes that are proliferating at an astronomical rate in Phoenix and Scottsdale. When we were up here, the lonely voice crying in Prescott, Phoenix and Scottsdale could have cared less, but now they're having a huge problem with these homes proliferating all over, and the residents are very unhappy. And so now we have Senator Bartow and Senator Kate Bofi McGee are introducing bills in the House to deal with structured sober living and patient brokering. And I will be pushing those same bills in the House. And with the government, uh, state involvement will be more effective because we're going to ensure that these homes provide a high standard of care. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we are going to try to uh, make sure that every person that comes into one of these homes has a background check, that we need to know if they had a criminal record or if they were arsonist or a sex uh, offender or something like that. So we're going to tighten the regulations on these homes for the health and safety of the members of, of the community that are using them. And we don't think that will be a problem because no one can dispute that they tout that there's a high standard of care. We want to just ensure that there is. So those are uh, primary things that I'll be looking at. Uh, I just uh, quickly I want to talk about PSPRS. I had an ad hoc committee 
all summer long where we went all over the state of Arizona discussing the, the pension problem that we have for our fire and police. And every city has a, a problem with it, some, some to a lesser degree than others. As you know, Prescott had a serious underfunding of their pension liability, and the way they solved that was raising the tax by 0.75% to pay off their pension liability. I'm one who has looked at this a long time. I don't think that's going to work long run. I think that the uh, we're such a state, uh, well, for example, statewide, the pension system is funded at 46%. Some cities are down to 5% funded. Bisbee, for example, some cities are much better. Your city is probably a better situation than Prescott because you're a younger city, a younger force. But either way, it is a time of reckoning that's going to come before you, and you're going to have to deal with it. And and the, the key thing in this thing is the assumption that the expected rate of return on the investment of 7.5, now 7.4 percent, that estimate is unrealistic, and it masks the true liability of the pension uh, obligation. So there's a lot of problems with pension reform and, and obligation, and we're we don't have any answers for it. And so we had this ad hoc committee where we went along the state, all over the state, talking about it to inform the public of what I perceive to be the coming tsunami of, of state government because only the state's going to be able to step in and try to solve this, but it's going to be a huge problem, and we don't want to let it get so far that we end up like Illinois or other states that, that they just can't meet those obligations. So... Um, uh, on the interstate I-17, we all know the problems with the, the I-17. Right now, there's no federal money to to do anything with it. And even if there was, even if President Trump got his trillion-dollar transportation budget passed, the state of Arizona does not have the matching funds. We have $25 million left over for road projects in this state. We're at a critical mass, and, you know, we have to look at other ways to, if we're going to have new interstate construction like the I-11 or, or changing the I-17 to make it safer, we're going to have to look at public-private partnerships because there's no money uh, in the system to do it right now. And they know how to do it. We know how to fix the I-17. It's just a matter of money, and uh, we don't have it. As to the HERF, we discussed what we're trying to do with that. And a portion of the HERF I want to quickly talk to you about is the <coughs> aviation fund, uh, which is authorized up to $25 million for airport development, airport uh, expansion, that kind of thing. They've swept that fund. <laughs> Every time there's a pile of money up there, they want to get their hands on it, and they do. That fund now has about $3 million in it. So even if we wanted to do something at the Prescott Airport and we wanted to go for grants to uh, the state. There's no money in there to do that right now. So I'm going to try to stop that sweep if I can and let that fund build up to its legal authorized limit, which is about $25 million. So we have a lot of issues down there, but the main thing is, as David said, what we did for our county, which was we basically said, if you don't give us the lottery money back that we deserve, that's a fairness issue. Why should we not be given a half a million dollars? It's money that should come to this county, and it did. And uh, the, the money that we spent on juvenile corrections, we got 80% of that back, and we got a $30 million restored to HERF. And every one of us, and I know David and I in the House, if we didn't get that, we were a no on the budget. And if we don't get it this year, I'm a no on the budget. And I'm telling these budgeteers early and often that we have to get certain things for our county or I'm not going to vote on the budget. And so if we have to drag that out, we'll do that. But they didn't send me down there to just go along with business as usual. I mean, I, we want things for our county, and if there's anything at the city level that I can do for you, let me know. We'll, the city of Prescott, we're meeting with them next week. They have some issues they want us to look at. So if you're, you, Mayor, and the city council, is anything we can do for you down there, I know you'll let me know, and we're, we're happy to do it for you the best we can. Thank you. Senator Fan, Hi. How are you guys doing? Okay, I was trying to jot some things down, and this is only a small scribbling of, of a few of the things I've got going on, but just to give you an idea. Uh, this year, I can tell you, as far as the budget goes, education is going to be at the top of that priority 
for everybody. It's a hotbed item. It is an election year, which makes it even more of a hot button item. So when we talk about the budget, you guys are going to see that there's going to be a lot of conversation and money that's going to be um, dealing with the education issue. So just want you guys to have that a heads up right off the bat. Uh, the governor has a water bill he is trying to work and facilitate. We really don't know exactly where we're going with that because nobody seems to know. They're coming in and they're talking to us and when I ask questions, they go, well, we're not sure about that yet or we're still working on it. And I basically said, you know, come back when you have something to talk about. But um, the two of the big, well, there were three things. Um, two of the big things was um, the number one goal is to uh, start storing some of our excess water banking it, if you will, in Lake Mead, so that would offset some of the potential drought that we are seeing now and can come down the pike. And I'm sure John Munderlow um, can expound on that at some point at another meeting because it's a big big conversation. Um, we uh, They're also talking about maybe putting some more ADWR rep representation and votes on the CAP board. That's not going over real well with CAP, so I think that is going to blow up sideways. And the third thing is they're actually suggesting maybe putting some uh, meters on exempt domestic wells. And I said, well, in case you haven't been to rural Arizona, you don't even know what a fight is. <laughs> so I said, uh, if you even try and put that in the bill, this bill will blow up. I, Ain't gonna, it just won't happen. So they said, okay, we'll go back and look at that one. So I don't think they totally understand that issue out in rural Arizona. Um, I am doing a bill uh, for our fire districts. Uh, minor little deal, but it was brought to us, <coughs> brought to be my, my, our own chief fry tag here. Apparently our fire departments and fire districts can get fingerprinting through DPS and the FBI for new hires, but our joint authority boards don't have the legal, legal permission to do that. So I know, it's silly. So I have to run a bill that will specifically put that in statute that our, our joint fire boards, our, uh, um, what did I just say, call them? Um, fire authority, our authority boards, uh, that they can do that. So I'm doing a bill on that. Her funding, uh, we did get $5 million in the budget last year to start some of the scoping and the studies and everything with that um, centerpiece um, going between Black Canyon City up to Badger Springs. You know, that Simpo has been um, going around doing a presentation on that, so I won't belabor that because I think most of you know what I'm talking about, but it's uh, we did get $5 million to get that thing at least started in the mix. And then as Noel said, we'll figure out how to get the money once we figure out how to do that. I am running a contracting indemnity bill. We were able to take care of that problem with the, uh, in, the pro in the public sector a few years ago, and I'm working on the private sector now. We have a problem with our contractors uh, that um, when we do um, sign contracts with the generals and the owners, if you will, a lot of times, this is private now, uh, there's all the time, there's things in the contract that says basically they're not responsible for anything for any reason whatsoever, even if it was their fault. And seriously, Larry, you've seen that before, right? Um, they used to try and do that in public works. We got rid of that too. <laughs> so we're working on the, uh, the private sector right now. Um, I'm also working on, uh, uh, I'm willing to take payments on it, so we'll figure out with a negotiation, but I'm working on getting money for the city of Prescott for our, um, because of the Granite Mountain 19 um, and the effect it had on the PSPRS, as you guys know. Um, you know, they had a $72 million deficit, um, and we thought right after the, a year after the Granite Mountain fire and our hot shots, we thought the five million that Andy and Steve and I had gotten in there would take care of it. And in fact, after the lawsuits and everything is all said and done, um, the hit was eleven and a half million dollars to the city of Prescott PSPRS. So I'm going to try and get that six and a half million dollars back to them somehow, um, because quite honestly, I don't think any of our municipalities should be responsible for something that, this was on state land, 
they were defending state land. This wasn't our own guys, so, I mean, our, our, in our own city limits. So I'm working on that as well. We'll figure out where that goes. Um, okay, uh, I, in fact, I had a meeting yesterday on this one. Construction sales tax, folks. Okay, you know it's coming back every year, right? <laughs> so um, one of the things we're trying to fix is what we call the MURA, M-R-R-A, that is the maintenance repair. For those of you that are involved, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, trust me, it could open up a bag of worms again and mess up with the cities and towns. So I'm trying to keep a handle on that to make sure that they don't go down that path again. Let's fix the problem with Murrah, but no, we're not going to point of sale and mess up rural Arizona again. So that's working on that one. Also, another thing from the taxing standpoint that municipalities need to keep an eye on is um, another committee I'm on we just met today is the, it's the issue of taxing of digital goods. And here's the deal, guys. So, you know, we have the thing called the cloud, right? So before, what did we do is if you went to go buy Microsoft Office or you went to go this and everything, you went down to Best Buy or Office Max or whoever and you bought the box, right? And you bought the license and you paid sales tax on it. Um, it but what's happening is more and more of this stuff is all in the cloud now. You don't physically go buy something anymore. You go online, you access it, and you download it. You are now buying that stuff. So there is this real convoluted issue going on with the Department of Revenue right now, whether that's a taxable transaction or not, because there's no tangible property you're holding on to, but it is a product that was always taxable before. And so now they're saying, well, it's not a product anymore, it's a service. So that's an issue we're looking at right now, and we've got some big heavy hitters that are trying to say it's not a taxable thing. And as I said today in the meeting, here is my real, real, real concern. When you bring that bill forward, it better be very tightly constructed because you can see where this is gonna go, right? So what else is going to be happening in the cloud? We know what's happening right now, but we, and what's going to happen 5, 10, 20 years from now. But what about all of the, right now we go when we rent a movie, we go rent a book, we go buy a book, we go buy a CD movie. All those things are taxable. TurboTax, you go and you buy that. Nope, that's in the cloud now. You can do that. Um, so you can see that all of our sales tax revenues, much of our sales tax real, rental, real, uh, retail sales tax that all of us from the state and the municipalities rely on, we could see a big shift here. And if we don't get a handle on it right away and all of a sudden somebody just says, oh yeah, nothing's going to be taxed in the cloud, we could find ourselves in a world of hurt. So um, please keep an eye out on that, guys, because that's something coming down the road. And then last but not least, uh, we are working on, uh, welcome to our world. So you know we have New River and Anthem um, in our district now. Guess what? The economy's doing great. Growth is happening again. And everybody is building houses and putting in exempt domestic wells in Anthem and New River and everywhere else in desert those areas. And the residents just, they can't figure out how that happens. Lot splits and their wells starting to go down a little bit because somebody else. And so uh, we said, well, we have a lot of experience in that area in our neck of the woods. So we're working on those issues with those guys as well. Thank you. Comments, uh, Vice Mayor? I'm glad I'm here in this seat. Thank you. <laughs> Jody, any comments? I just appreciate our legislators, the work that they've been doing and going moving forward with. Um, Senator Fan, you mentioned the MURA, that we definitely want to be able to work with that and not that point of sale. I know it does come back. How Do you have an idea at this point? What can we do to take care of that once and for all? Um, I will tell you that there is a, it was a very heated discussion uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, there's an organization that I do respect, um, they're called ATRA, um, Arizona Tax, Tax Research Association, 
Atra, um, and they are a very powerful and strong voice down there, and they are the ones, um, as well as the, the uh, building association, the, the developers, Spitzer, um, they want the point of sales. And so this is a constant battle. So as long as ATRA is there trying to push that, push that, push that, I don't think it will ever go away. Councilwoman Rooney, I think that it's going to just, it's going to keep there and it's going to take good, strong people that understand that what the devastation that would happen to our municipalities if, if they go down that path. It could be really bad. Michael? Well, I think uh, I, I liked hearing about the HER funds, and we had a meeting, I think, uh, yesterday uh, talking about some of the transportation funding or lack of transportation funding. And I was wondering from the HER perspective, is this something, it sounds like this is the second year that a bill's been submitted to try and ad address that. Are you anticipating that something will happen this, this session? Yes, I'm anticipating that that bill will be shoved in a drawer someplace. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, mean, I mean, you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak down there. And everybody knows this is the right thing to do. And uh, so when I started this journey last year, I knew it was uphill, but I wanted to raise the issue, the consciousness to the public of the dire needs that our transportation system is in. When that bridge went out on the I-10, those truckers and manufacturers up in Flagstaff knew to a penny how much it cost them to route around. And so uh, it's critical. And, and I tell this to people, and I'm a conservative Republican, but the government has to do three things, and three things only has to do. Public safety, public education, and transportation. The first thing the Federal Congress did in session was on the postal roads, okay? We need transportation because it's so vital to our economy. And it's well understood that every dollar we put into transportation will turn up a $3 economic return. So I'm willing to step out front. Uh, we do have strong backers, though. We have League of Cities and Towns, Chamber of Commerce, Arizona Rock Products, Arizona Contractors Association, Arizona Trucking Industry. We have strong support at the grassroots level to do this, but unfortunately it takes leadership. It takes that decision by the governor and the Speaker of the House and the President of the Senate to allow these bills to come forward. And the quickest way you kill a bill in the House is double assign it. And, and it almost makes it impossible to get the, the bill out. But I'm gonna do it again this year and all I can do is keep trying. And I'm sure the following year after the governor is reelected, things might change. I don't really know, but we will see. I hope that answered your question. Well, it does. And, you know, I think there's just a lot of frustration about uh, the lack of funds. And it kind of, uh, to me, it's a kind of a shock because we're, we're relating to what we have available as the only solution rather than looking out beyond let, let me tell you what will not happen for sure. There will be no raise in gasoline or diesel tax. When you say tax down there, it's a nasty word. And, and remember, the last time we raised our gas tax was in 91. Uh, a, a dollar in tax revenue in 91 is worth 47 cents today just due to inflation. So we're not even keeping up. Okay. So the things that I am proposing, the bills that I am dropping are not taxes, they're fees. And which means that uh, it would have to be voter approved. It might require a supermajority of the House or the Senate, but how else do you do it? You cannot squeeze blood out of a turnip. And I didn't, as chairman of the Transportation Depart uh, Committee, I'm committed to try to make our roads and highways and bridges safer. And, uh, but I can't do it unless everybody's on board. But we do have support for it at the grassroots level, that's for sure. Uh, Rick? No, I Marty? Have nothing to add. Yeah, I have a few questions, and <clears throat> I'll just ask them all and go through the comments, and then uh, you guys can answer it. Uh, regarding the uh, ESAs that David was talking about earlier, I know the local school board is against the ESAs because basically they look at it as taking uh, public funds and paying for private schools, and we just think that's wrong. Uh, I know how where you sit on it, but that's okay. Uh, regarding uh, the criminal justice, I think what you said was very well. 
Uh, and just to let you know, next year's Arizona Town Hall will be talking about criminal justice. That's their topic for next year. So that will be uh, pretty good. Uh, regarding transportation, I, I think you said it very well, uh, Noel, and uh, we, we just have to keep pushing at that. I mean, last year, when we were here, we were talking about the HER funds and the way they get swept, and you know, we were talking about the 10 cent gas tax, that if it was imposed, it wouldn't even be seen by the, uh, you know, by the public for the simple reason that gas prices are fluctuating by 10, 20, and 30 cents on a regular basis. You know, when you're talking about tax and it being a dirty word, okay, the income that the state uses is from sales tax, income tax. So tax isn't a bad thing. I know it's unwanted by some people, but it's not a totally bad thing. And in this case, I think it would be totally necessary. Uh, and as far as uh, education uh, that you were talking about, uh, we definitely need to improve the situation because as a community, Prescott, Prescott Valley, Chino, Dewey Humboldt, we're always looking to get businesses here. And one of the first questions they ask is, what's the education system look like? And when they look it up and they go, Arizona is 48th, 49th, 50th, depending on which study you ask for, whether it's uh, for, you know, how much we pay per student or whatever other statistic they're at, we're at the bottom. And I know this year uh, the Arizona Town Hall will present, will be presenting their findings because this year's topic was uh, educating, you know, funding education. So uh, I, I think most of what you guys are doing is really good for the communities, you know, but there are some things that maybe the input from the community should be your guiding light, not your personal persuasion. Uh, Mr. May, if I may just respond. Uh, and Marty, I appreciate all of those comments, and I always appreciate your, your candor. Uh, but on the ESA, I wanted to explain, and there's a sort of a false narrative out here about the ESA. The ESA, uh, when, when families and children get an ESA, uh, we're actually educating that, chi that child for less money than what we're spending at a at a at the government school level at the district school level so the ESAs actually save taxpayer money as well as providing school choice the other point uh, that i think is not fully appreciated i think by the school community is that we cap the ESAs uh, it's capped at i think uh, 5000 5000 per year increase so over the five the next five or six years it can only increase by about 30000 uh, so this is not something that's going to be devastating uh, to the to the district schools. And when you look at what's actually going on in Yavapai County, at least in the local districts, there's very, very few people who are taking advantage of this. It's being taken advantage of by other communities across the state. But up here in Yavapai County, we have pretty good schools. And I, and I wanted to comment about, about our schools because there's another false narrative going on that Arizona has bad schools because they keep citing these statistics while well, you're 44th or, or, or 48th or 49th or 50th in funding. I don't dispute that. Different studies show different things, but we're clearly at the bottom. But that's on funding. We are not at the bottom on student achievement. Here in Yavapai County in particular, and here in Prescott Valley, you have excellent schools. All of your schools, I think, got A's and B's. I'm not sure if there was, maybe one school might have got a C. But um, they have, we have very good schools here in Arizona. Five of the top ten public schools in the country are in Arizona. Okay, we uh, we are the uh, we are leading the state in, in school improvement, uh, and again, we're nowhere near the bottom. We're closer to the middle, and that's nothing to brag about. But it is simply uh, a false narrative that because we fund at a low rate, that our student achievement is also at a low rate. That's simply not true. Uh, Noel and I have actually been going around meeting with some of the school folks, meeting with superintendents. We're going to be in Prescott uh, next week with Joe Howard. We were out here to meet uh, Dan Streeter. I think I think Karen was involved in that. So we get out and we listen and. We talk uh, to our school folks. We know how the, the district schools feel about ESAs. They see it as a threat. But there's many, many other uh, schools in this area, the, the charter schools, the private schools, uh, who support ESAs very, very strongly. So our governor supports it. Uh, there's tremendous support in this state for school choice. Uh, it's going to be on the ballot. The voters are going to decide. Uh, and that's the way it's going to work. But remember this. If the voters decide to support school choice and to maintain the ESA, then we have a mandate from the voters to support ESA, and then I think you will see the cap go away because we'll have a fresh voter mandate 
that we want ESA. So I think they maybe have overplayed their hand by putting it on the ballot. We'll see what happens. Uh, Marty, I'd like to uh, talk about another area of education that I think you will find more pleasing, and that is Prop 301. Proposition 301 is up for renewal in uh, 2020. The 0.6% uh, sales tax generates about $630 million a year for education. The business community, like-minded representatives and legislators who agree that Prop 301 needs to be renewed and increased, and I am one of those. I uh, believe uh, in all-day uh, kindergarten as a full grade, and we know from the statistics what it does to the learning process, getting children able to read by age uh, third grade. So I came to this slowly because I was one of those who felt that all-day kindergarten was more of a babysitting service. But it, after educating myself and learning, I, I agree that it's so important. So I will support Prop 301. The issue for me is how much, because if we go from 0.6 to 1%, that'll be an additional 400 million. There is a big push on now to go to 1.5%. 1.5% from 0.6%, which it is now, will bring in a total of another $900 million. And with that $900 million, we'll be able to allocate money for teacher salaries, all-day kindergarten, capital improvement, and many other issues. And the best thing about it is, and it has to be approved by the voters. And I've always been one that if the voters mandate something, who am I to say no? And so I, I think that this is the solution for education. Put it to the voters. Grassroots. Now, there's two ways we can go. We can go with the referendum and vote on it in the House to put it before the voters, or it can be a grassroots initiative. But there are business people in Phoenix who are talking about $2 million to go through in the initiative process. And I would support that. I mean, it's one thing to talk about education. It's another thing to back it up with the will of the people. And what better way to do that than have the voters vote on that? And I will support that. I don't know how much I would support from 1% up, but, but at least I'm gone from 0.6 to 1%, and I want to renew it. So uh, there's hope. I mean, you're looking at me. I'm a conservative Republican, but I know how important education is, a public school. I, but on the other hand, I support ESAs. I support homeschooling. I support parochial education. I support an education, whatever works. If it works, it's a win for our society. An educated student is a good citizen. That's a win for us, however it happens. But just so you know, I will support 301. Karen? Well, education really isn't a, a factor of a council, so I'm, I think I won't belabor the subject any longer. <laughs> yeah, Laura? I didn't have any questions, but I do have some comments after listening to you in. Uh, Representative Campbell, I, I, I watched all of you, but in particular, you just keep pounding away at Mission Impossible. And you know what? A block of ice, if you chip at it often enough, it cracks open. So I want to thank you and I want to encourage you to just keep shipping away, particular when they're sweeping our funds. And uh, Representative Springer, you made one of the most important points about education. We have outstanding education here. And until all of us start talking about that issue of education, we can't change the perception for developers and other people coming in here. We have a classroom at Kaido Springs that's been adopted by NASA. Why aren't we bragging about that everywhere? We had some of the highest grants given to our graduates that we've ever had. We can stand tall and proud. So um, I want to start a campaign about bragging about the facts instead of dealing about the negatives with education. I'm sick and tired of hearing about the negative education when we're achieving. And Karen, bless your heart, you've worked at every level of government. You know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and you know the stuff you want to bury and throw over a cliff. 
and I'm so proud of you for digging in, sticking it out, and taking care of us, because I meant it when I said I'd rather be here in this seat. I really get a chance to do something with a very low level of frustration compared to what the three of you have to put up with. So I don't just thank you, I applaud you. You know, we uh, do appreciate that we have this meeting with you. Karen, you've been working for us for years and done a good job. And Noel and David, I know that you're on the same road as, as Karen. We, I think our representation in this district, we're doing very well. Some districts, I uh, hate to say it, but I haven't had that assured feeling. There's uh, uh, two things that we're very concerned about. One is legislators trying to micromanage the cities and towns. And granted, when uh, cities and towns aren't perfect either. And once, but I do not think it's the state legislator's job to try to manage us. I think it's if they want to do dumb, let them do dumb without your help. The other point is uh, giving away of tax dollar, taxpayer dollars. Not doing too bad on that, although you do have your eight hundred dollar, you know, joint credits and so forth. I, I, uh, I, I uh, I'm kind of uh, puzzled about whether that's a core function of government to give away taxpayer dollars. But anyway, other than uh, those two issues, I think the legislators generally do, do a good job. I know you three are doing a very good job for us, and we appreciate it. Next comment. I, I would just say to that, Mayor, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I voted uh, with the cities that wanted to regulate the plastic bags that uh, they were floating around. And then that was stopped at the state level by a state law mandate. I didn't agree with that. I think that local uh, charter cities and municipalities should have that authority to regulate uh, for their community. Not every city wants to regulate plastic bags, but those that do have a reason, makes sense, and uh, I support that. And uh, I, so that's why I voted. Uh, I call it the plastic bag bill. I voted to give those cities that... Uh, wanted to do that, the authority to do it. Good. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I, first, I agree with you. I think the most effective government is the government that's closest to the people, and that's obviously the local government. So philosophically, uh, I'm, I'm in tune with what you're suggesting here. On your second point about giving away tax dollars, I wasn't clear on the context. Are you referring to tax credits? Are you talking about ESAs? What are you... No, tax credits as well. Tax right. credits, sure. Yeah. I, I think I agree I, with you I, on I'm that I'm not well. really totally opposed to it, but, but it just, I don't know, taxpayer dollars... When I was uh, sworn in as mayor in 2004, we had a uh, we discovered that uh, they were giving you know charities uh, 11,000 here, 14,000 there, and you know they had a, it was a total of about 100 thousand dollars, and we uh, we didn't just chop it. We took one third, thanks to our uh, town manager, especially he guided us through it. One one third the first year, one third the second year, and one third the third year, and, and we eliminated that. In other words, I do not believe that it's government function. Our federal government just loves to give away taxpayer dollars. Of course, they're twenty trillion dollars in debt too. Thank you for that clarification, sir. And at, at the risk of presumption, uh, I have maybe another five or ten minutes, and then I have to scoot to my other engagement. I would love to hear what are the priorities of the city of Prescott Valley uh, in terms of a legislative agenda. So if you guys could uh, let me know that before I have to leave, I'd be grateful. Let's hear what our town manager has to say. Larry? First off, I'd like to uh, to thank you all. Thank you all for coming tonight, uh, uh, taking the time to, to share your thoughts and, and your agenda for the new year. We, we don't have much of a list, and I, I think uh, Mayor and Council have hit on most of those points, as have you. Uh, the, the first item uh, is actually uh, from our municipal court. And Judge, uh, you've got a couple of comments uh, as it relates to uh, the regulation of, or potential regulation of municipal courts. All right, and good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Senator Fan, and 
uh, representatives Campbell and Stringer. Uh, none of you put on your list the, um, the report that came out to try to change the court system of municipal courts to make them, I don't know, I think it's state courts or whatever, and they came up with some reasons. But as uh, uh, Larry indicates, I was asked to come here to talk about kind of two aspects of that. One is the report suggests influence in regard to the judges. My name's Keith Carson. I've been the municipal judge here in Prescott Valley for uh, 19 years plus, and uh, we have uh, about, uh, last I, I checked just recently, uh, over 9,000 filings a year, so we're one of the larger courts as well, and uh, I would be able to easily say in the 19 plus years, any of the mayors and councils I've worked for over the years, and there's been numerous town managers as well, numerous, I have never felt any undue pressure at all. So you can kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So if somebody says, yeah, the, all these judges are, are under pressure, you can say, well, no, I, I talked to one or I heard from one, and uh, he's been doing it for a long time through lots of council, number of mayors, number of town managers, and I just have never felt that. And I've appreciated that as well, because at certain times I kind of like, what if they do, if this were to happen, I just have never had to deal with it at all. So I wanted to share that. And then the other aspect that uh, it's uh, maybe there's some pressure on me to do something regarding money. Again, I've never had a mayor, council, town managers in all my years say, well, Judge, you've got to start finding these people more money. We need more money. It has just never happened. And I treat the court uh, separate from the, the town, and I just don't have any pressure in that regard so I'm free to deal with my court on a fairness basis to everybody not with oh no what's uh, this uh, person going to say no I, I treat them fairly and I think if you talk to virtually uh, most of the people that I deal with they'll say you know I got treated fairly it's not something where yeah they're just out for this or that or money and, and so forth so I feel very proud of that and I'm really proud of the mayor and council members and and people I've worked with uh, so that they respect the difference on that so again just something to have in the back of your mind when you read something or somebody says well uh, that's not the case you have somebody that's been dealing with a lot of different people over the 19 plus years and it just isn't happening uh, here so um, anything else uh, to address on that do you have any questions in regard to that I, I, I did want to real quickly say um, uh, representative Campbell I 20 plus years ago I was on the periphery of sober living houses and the federal regu regulations on that. Good luck on that. I'm interested in the airport because I'm a pilot, so I like to know where I'm going to land is good. Um, and uh, Representative Stringer, uh, I'd be uh, very interested to find out what the factual information you find that we're seventh on the one statistic you said for Arizona and how uh, what the trade-off is to move us down the list further, you know, because I know there's always trade-offs for different things. Um, and Senator, or I'm sorry, yeah, Senator Fan, you know, I appreciate you say, don't open door number A. You won't believe what will come out of there. And, and just for all of you, I'm glad I'm doing what I'm doing that I feel is a non-political kind of thing, and I enjoy that. I'm glad there's people like you that enjoy it. And uh, uh, Council Member Rooney, I think, wants to join that, I'm not, I think. And so, again, congratulations for having that kind of thinking. And, of course, the mayor and council member, again, I always am in awe what they do uh, all the time, virtually every day. Uh, and I'm just so happy to do what I do every day. Day, which I view, like I say, is non-political. All right. Any questions or comments? Uh, if, if I may, just to respond um, with respect to the uh, where Arizona ranks in comparison with other states, the site is to the Department of Justice uh, statistics. They rank Arizona as seventh highest in the nation as a per capita incarceration uh, rate, and in the bottom half 
uh, of the states with respect to uh, recidivism. So these are uh, these are sort of publicly uh, these are published by the Department of Justice. These uh, statistics. I do appreciate your comment about not being pressured. If anything comes before the Judiciary Committee and we need a witness, I'm going to think of you. <laughs> Very good. Why'd you All do right, that? Thank yeah, you. Okay, why'd I do this then? Okay, very good. Any thank other, you. Any other comments, or you can move anyone? on to your next issues? Thank you very much. Appreciate I think it. the judge exemplifies something that we're very fortunate on. We have a very high level of trust of our staff, and they have not let us down. They've taken good care of matters. Judge does that. Any comments, either uh, any of you? Okay, the next point that we have on our, our list is uh, the PSPRS board. Uh, the, we know that there are modifications being suggested uh, and, and or some have been implemented already, like the Tier 3 added to PSPRS. We thank you for anything that you uh, do in that respect. And uh, uh, as Noel had said, you know, there are some cities that are hit harder than others. Us, not so much. We have a younger police force, uh, uh, and so that that's worked well for us. Uh, but as it relates to the PSPRS boards, uh, there is the proposal that there just be one board rather than 90 of them or whatever it is as, uh, as it relates to all the uh, governmental entities around the state. We wholeheartedly support that centralizing it and I, there was one proposal about regionalizing it where there'd be maybe five boards statewide no no just one centralized board i think would serve uh, the system a lot better uh, you would have that consistency and i if i was a police officer i would certainly want that i would want the consistency statewide so that one uh, governmental entity is not treating a particular issue differently than another. I think that there's some real value there, and I think there's also dollar savings associated with that. Could I just thank you for that comment? It just, if I could get a clarification, are you referring to the different municipalities that are participating in the PSPRS system? Because there are every municipality sort of has its own uh, fund. It's all administered by one board, but there are how many others? A couple of hundred, I believe, different municipalities who are paying into the fund and have sort of their own actuarial. We're suggesting that there be one board statewide rather than 200 boards. Okay. Now, and, and that's great, but you realize that if you do that, then cities like Prescott Valley which don't have a, a serious problem right now, or at least not to the same magnitude as cities like Prescott and Bisbee and a number of other municipalities around the state, you would actually be aggregating the funds and maybe subsidizing their deficit. So I'm, I'm not talking at all about aggregating the, the benefits that are paid out. Okay, that's okay, what I needed that, to clarify. What I'm very simply saying is that the judicial side of PSPRS is broken down to the various governmental entities. Mayor Skoog is the chairperson of our local PSPRS board. I'm on that board as well. I'm suggesting that's fool, foolish and it's costing a lot of money to PSPRS because of the lack of consistency statewide. One board might be giving away the farm, another board being very rigorous in their investigation of an application for benefits. Going ahead and making that into one board gives you consistency across the state. I thank you for that clarification. I agree with you. That would that would actually promote consistency, and uh, I think that's actually a good idea. I'm going to let Noel uh, weigh in on this. Uh, Larry, the, the prime example of what you're talking about is the city of Bisbee. Uh, a statewide uh, disability for officers is 15 percent. The city of Bisbee, which is the far the greatest unfunded liability of any city in, in Arizona has 30% of their officers on disability. And that is because of these local boards. You're absolutely right, because the boards take care of their own. And if you went to a statewide board that just looked at the problem and had no personal knowledge of the individual, I think it would be a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know where that's at right now. Uh, that is not something that has come forward, but I, I agree in the principle, and that's the example that I just I said. Mm -hmm. 
Quick question. Um, have you talked to the League of Cities and Towns about this? Is this something they would be supportive of and willing to put forth a resolution in August on? They are absolutely in, in support of that, or at least their staff member that was hired uh, that has their expertise in uh, the PSPRS. Nick, Nick uh, Ponder, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, we would wholeheartedly support that, and we'll, we'll monitor it going forward. We just ask that if it does end up uh, landing on, uh, on your table that you would uh, uh, take a look at that Absolutely. and seriously consider going down that path. The next item that we have that's uh, of a concern, as you, you might not be shocked, and you've already touched on it, uh, that's SB 1487. Uh, if we want to uh, ban uh, plastic bags in Prescott Valley, we ought to have that uh, capability without going ahead and having state shared revenues threatened. Bottom line. And, and we disagree with uh, the legislation that went forward that said that uh, state shared revenues can be withheld if an individual city or town uh, chooses to uh, go down a different path. And so you've heard that from the League of Cities and uh, uh, we don't need to go into any detail on that. We just want you to know that we feel, although we are, don't go off the path Path, if you will, uh, that if there's a community that feels they have to go in a different direction, that, that's their prerogative in our view. So enough said on that. With that, uh, Norm Davis wanted to uh, uh, bring up I-17 and HERF, and you guys have covered that quite nicely. Thank you. Mayor Council, Senator Fan, Representative Campbell, Representative Stringer, uh, thank you for letting me speak to you tonight. Um, as Manager Tarkowski says, I think you covered the issues very well on I-17 and HERF. You get it. You get it very well. I think you covered everything. All my bullet points, you hit square right on the head. We've talked about this for years. I've talked to you in the past. Uh, thank you for getting it. I do want to thank um, Senator Fent and Representative Campbell. Thank you for coming to our Real Transportation Conference this past October. You worked very hard at transportation, and you brought to us directly what we wanted to hear. So I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules because it was very beneficial to us. So you do hear us, and I think you're working on issues, and that's why you all hit it right on top of the head of, of what, what we're looking for. I think the one thing I did want to comment on is obviously we've been talking about expansion of funding. Um, Everything I read is, yes, we could have a structural deficit in the state budget this year. I'm not going to continue to hammer on any expansion of particular revenues. Um, we'll probably go to education. We understand that. But one thing to um, always always keep in mind is we do need to look to make that pie bigger. I don't know when that – we've talked about that for years and years and years. I, I do like the fact when you say some of those particular new revenue sources, uh, very much so the people that use our system that aren't paying being the alternative fuel vehicles, I think that's really the lowest hanging fruit that will be easy to implement. And I think it makes sense. That might be something I might ask to focus on rather than use that ugly three-letter word, uh, tax. Um, may, maybe that's one that makes nothing but good sense to people that drive alternative fuel vehicles, and they are paying, paying their fair share. So I hope you focus on um, that notwithstanding. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, that's a, um, a very impactive term. But that HERF diversion, uh, very significant to DPS, but I understand uh, you are working hard uh, to continue to keep the funding to low gauges, and we're going to do what we can for our transportation system. With that, that's really all the comments I have. Mr. My apologies, Mr. Mayor and Council. I'm going to have to go, but thank you very much for having me uh, here. And, of course, you're all welcome to contact me uh, individually if you have any questions or follow-up. Thank you very much. Well, we sure appreciate that you came and understand that you have – sometimes you can't multitask. Thank you, sir. Good job. Thank you. Any more further questions for me? Questions, anyone? Comments? Laura, did you have a comment? Um, on the I-17, <clears throat> I've been uh, traveling that about four times a week now, and I have a whole new appreciation for, <laughs> for how dangerous it is, how frustrating it is. And yesterday, I was just black, I was flat out frightened, frightened. And my, I have a simple question, and, and I don't know that you can have the answer. Is it just a funding issue, or is the problem so immense that no one wants to tackle it? Uh, 
Councilwoman, I'll take that one. Um, obviously, the number one problem is you can't do anything and tackle any problem if you don't have the resources to do that. So I would say funding is number one um, because everything else is moot if you can't, if you don't have the re revenues to do that, right? Um, so yeah, funding is huge. Uh, number two, it's it's not an easy highway. There's difficulties, as we all know. Um, I, I We were talking about this a little earlier. Um, I was sitting on I-17 for 40 minutes on my way up here because of a car fire. And um, you could see the flames just shooting and luckily we were able enough people we were backed up for miles and miles and luckily the mayor fire district with dps escorts actually had to go down i-17 find some place to come across which they had to somehow weed between stop vehicles and then weave their way along the side so this isn't just about our inconvenience and this it's public safety if they can't get to those fires, hypothetically, we could have another catastrophic fire up and down I-17 for the mere fact that we can't get public safety there quick enough to take care of that. So this is this is a huge level, and, and we need to start making some plans about not only fixing it for now and future growth, but looking at it from a public safety standpoint as well. Good. Any other comments? Anything else, Norm? No, thank you, Mayor. Hey, thanks, Norm. Okay, any uh, other comments? Larry, that uh, 1487, I sure hope you uh, do something about that. That uh, was one other, other bill that I thought was totally idiotic. And I don't remember where it came from, but not a very bright maneuver. Totally uh, out of the concept of stay out of cities and towns business. Uh, Jody, Mike, anyone? Laura? Rick? Said too much. Already. Anything you want to If I to? might, just one minute of closing. Um, you guys are very kind. Your words were very kind tonight, and we appreciate it because you know how much we love to work with you guys. Um, but I also want to say we are really the lucky ones because the three of us work um, in probably, I would say, the best district in the entire state. We know all of our mayors, all of our council people. We work with you. We play with you. We've known you for years. And it is so frustrating to see other legislators down there that do not know one single mayor or council person in their district. They don't go to their council meetings. There is no connection whatsoever. And when you ask how some of these stupid bills get done, that's because you have legislators down there that do not understand and do not have the relationship that the three of us do um, with our mayors and councils and our board of supervisors. So um, I know it's getting a little deep in here, but I mean that, I, we mean that from the bottom of our heart. Truly, we're the lucky ones because we've got the best people to work with. Well, that's, that's not by accident. You've uh, been on a council, you understand it. I know Noel has been very close to the, uh, not only Prescott uh, Council, but to us, and we appreciate that. And, and I think that's made a huge difference. You've done a good job, and we appreciate that. Any other comments from anyone? So I don't know if you want to stay for the rest of it. You're sure welcome to it. Thank you. Um, I have another thing to go to as well. So. You have another. And I think Noel's going to go too. So. Well, <laughs> you're sure welcome to stay. Thank you very much, and Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah. Happy New Year. Uh, well, you have a good one. I will. I will. It's going to be about a month. No, it'll be about a month before that next group is formed. Thank you. Well, you have a good Christmas. Stay in touch. Okay, we move on to number four. Presentation, Prescott Valley Water Basics. And I take it that would be John. You're up, John. Thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council. Um, about uh, the end of September, um, in your wisdom, you instructed Neil Wadsworth and myself to reach out to our community and um, provide some background information about our water supplies and our water infrastructure. Uh, we've been out in the community. Uh, we've made about uh, five presentations, the two of us. I've made a, an additional one on my own. 
Um, and um, a well-received presentation by the, by the folks out there. We've hit about 150 to 160 people. Um, in our presentation, though, we found that we could not get through this without at least two hours. Um, so we've split it up. Um, I, I saw a little gasp. We split it up. Um, Neil will not be here tonight. He had a personal commitment elsewhere. Uh, so I'll give my half of the presentation. He'll come back to you probably in January and talk about water infrastructure. So so the, the heart of what I want to address is this basic question. Uh, which we hear over and over again from the public, which is how does growth get water? As the economy is improving, as the growth is coming back into our community, many folks don't understand this. And I think what really the, the core of the question is, is will my water be impacted by growth? That's really the, the specific thing people, I think, are asking. I've heard this question literally uh, all my life, all my life, um, <laughs> about whether growth will impact water supplies. So I tell the folks, let your heart not be troubled. Arizona has the strongest consumer protection program regarding water of any state in the nation. And nobody has taken me at my word. So I've had to go through my presentation anyway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so to get to this, I have to provide a little bit of background. And so that I'm basically giving you the presentation I've given the rest of the public. And this is for the opportunity of people who are viewing by TV. So, a little bit of background. Arizona's uh, water supplies are, are basically structured, at least in our area, along these four major areas. A groundwater, surface water, reclaimed water, and imported supplies. Those are the supplies that are available to us, and they're divided into these um, areas, um, not only because they're uh, practically uh, uh, describable in that fashion, uh, but because our water laws are specific to each type of water supply. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of these. Groundwater is our primary source of water. Uh, specifically in Prescott Valley, it's almost exclusively our source of water right now for the, for the homes and the businesses in our area. Um, but we rely on an area aquifer. It's the same aquifer that Prescott, Chino Valley, Dewey Humboldt, and many of the other rural areas uh, rely on. So we have to talk about it in terms of a joint water supply. Um, this water supply, this aquifer, contains almost a trillion gallons of water. It's a huge amount of water. It's about two and a half times the volume of water that is in Lake Pleasant when it's full. Now, if you've ever been to Lake Pleasant, it's a large body of water. There's a little picture of it on the screen. <clears throat> I'll show it again later. Um, <clears throat> and that water supply is literally, from where I'm standing, only about three blocks away. It's hard for people to understand that because you can't see it. It's directly below our feet, but it is not that far away and it extends throughout our area. So that is a primary source of water supply to us. Um, it's a large amount of water. We use from that water supply about two thousandths of it per year. So we're not in a balanced situation, but we're not overusing it to the extent where we are going to run out at any, um, you know, any time close. Matter of fact, there's, there's significantly more than a hundred year supply available to us right now. Our water levels are in decline. Um, that's part of why we have a big regulatory structure um, that controls how we use that water supply. But the decline is not significant. It's around a foot per year on average throughout the basin. And what's surprising to most people <clears throat> is that our actual groundwater pumping hasn't increased since the 1960s. In spite of all the growth, we're still pumping about the same amount of groundwater as we did back in the 60s. And that's because our economy has transitioned from one of back in the 60s and 70s of an agriculturally based economy to one now where we're, <clears throat> um, uh, depending on you know, more commercial growth established sort of things. Because of our water um, regulatory structure, those water rights weren't allowed to expand. Instead, they were transferred from one type of use to another. 
this is just a little diagram picture map uh, showing the extent of our groundwater basin. Now, the state of Arizona established this groundwater basin as a regulatory basin and gave it its name. Where else would you get a name like the Prescott Active Management Area Groundwater Basin? Um, but it's significant. Uh, so the basin basically runs from the tops of the mountains, Mingus Mountain to the east, Granite Mountain to the west, Bradshaw Mountains to the south, up to north of Chino Valley. That basin is our joint groundwater supply for the area. Just a quick, another quick shot of Lake Pleasant, just so that you can kind of get the scale of it. Uh, again, this, this is the lake that is uh, just to the other side of the Bradshaw Mountains on the north side of Phoenix, and our groundwater supply is about two and a half times that amount. And just as further proof, um, this is based on some data from the Arizona Department of Water Resources, so showing uh, groundwater pumping going back to 1965. And as you can see from the chart, we have not increased. As a matter of fact, in a, in a very big sense, we've decreased overall groundwater pumping since those um, high pumping days in the 70s. <clears throat> and I apologize, but I think this is nearly my last background slide so that you have that understanding of the hydrologic situation. So when we talk about, and, and I'm sorry to have alluded to a lake of water, our aquifer is not an underground lake. Um, our water is held in tiny little spaces between the grains of sand and sediment and rock that fills our basin. So, but it's a large uh, basin. It's a, it's a large um, uh, body of material, and about 10% of it is water. So that's where we depend on our supply. Above that uh, saturated zone, the, you know, we get to the water table. Below the water table is uh, saturated supply, and above that, uh, we have vacant space in those uh, grains of sand, so to speak. And we take advantage of that vacant space. Now, that's where we store recharge water. We have a, a volume of, of storage there. It's a good place to put water, and it doesn't evaporate once it gets in there. So let's get into um, some of the regulatory structure. Uh, in 1980, the legislature, uh, we just had a, a nice discussion with uh, uh, some legislators a few minutes ago. Uh, so that body uh, decided to create the 1980 Groundwater Management Act. That act created our active management area and um, four or five others, four others um, in the state. And you can see on the map the the colored areas are the active management areas. Now those groundwater basins cover only about 15% of the state, but about 80, 85% of the population live in those areas. So most of the population is covered by what is essentially a Consumer Protection Act. So that act also created the Arizona Department of Water Resources. Um, just so people understand that's a real agency, there's their great big fancy building down in Phoenix. Um, and uh, it's full of people who are experts with water, the regulators, their hydrologists, administrators, and that sort of thing. They keep track of what we do uh, here in the Prescott Active Management Area, in Prescott Valley as water providers, and throughout the rest of the state. So they're the enforcement arm of the Act. It's important to note that the Act is managed by the state government because many times I encounter people who believe that, that you as a town council create water loss. And you don't. The state has not um, given you that authority. They've held on to that authority um, solely for themselves. And so when a new subdivision wants to come forward and get its water supplies, it's not typically the town councils who have the, the authority to make rules about that. The rules are already in place. So um, it's the state that holds that authority and um, they hold it on, on to it very tightly. With this uh, 1980 Groundwater Management Act comes a whole bunch of rules. Um, and I'm really only gonna talk about a couple of them here. 
Oh, the first one on the list, the 100-year assured water supply requirement for subdivisions. So what this means is that every subdivision in our area has had to demonstrate that it has at least 100 years water supply available to it before um, you as a town council can approve that subdivision plat. So they have to get that approval from the state before you as a town council can approve the other elements of that plat that are related to zoning and planning and that sort of thing. But the water supply has to be proven. Uh, it's, it's reviewed by state hydrologists, and they're very conservative in their estimate of what a 100-year assured water supply means. So our residents have a 100-year assured water supply. Another element that we need to talk about uh, later on is reaching safe yield by 2025. It's the last bullet on the list. And as I said, our water supplies are dropping at a, at a um, moderate pace. It's nothing we have to be alarmed about, but we have to address that drop by year 2025. A little bit more about the 100-year assured water supply. So the way it works is kind of like a bank account. Um, at least this was a, an analogy that uh, Neil came up with, so I'm going to blame him if people don't catch, get it. Um, <laughs> and he's not here to defend himself. And, and he's, he's not here to defend himself. Um, he gets to laugh. laugh, laugh. <laughs> but but he'll, he'll be able to uh, talk to you in a month or so. Um, so it's kind of like a bank account, uh, just like our water supply is in a uh, kind of a common place, a, a common aquifer. Um, the vault is in a bank is kind of a common place to store money, but everybody has their individual accounts and you're not able to withdraw more than your individual account allows you to withdraw. So it's kind of a, a rough analogy of how these things work. So even though it is a common groundwater basin, you can't take out more than you were granted. And that's how the state manages not only a hundred year assured water supply certificates, but other water rights as well. Now, these are these were based off of groundwater allocations that were made prior to 1999. On January 23rd, 1999, the director of the Department of Water Resources declared this to be in a state of groundwater mining, and from that point forward, no subdivisions get an allocation to the groundwater system. There's no new allocations made for groundwater from that point forward. And as you all are aware, we have not had a significant subdivision approval in Prescott Valley for 18 years, going on 19 years. That's huge. This is essentially a program that has significantly limited growth in our area. So what's that mean for the existing residents? So the people that are here in their homes now, they got their 100-year assured water supply. The growth that we see occurring in places like Granville along uh, Glassford Hill Road and, and elsewhere, that being the most visible to people, are on lots that were approved with a 100-year assured water supply back prior to 1999. So all of these lots, all of this growth for the most part is based off of 100-year assured water supplies to groundwater. New subdivisions don't get that benefit. They just don't. So new subdivisions, in other words, it's a long way to go to get here. Remember I said let your heart not be troubled. Um, but new subdivisions by law, by state law, not by city law, but by state law, can't come after existing subdivisions water supplies. So then how do they get water? You know, what's, what's available to them? If it's not groundwater, well, it's some of these other sources that we talked about. Um, they, can't create, they can't take a new allocation uh, to the aquifer, but they can go acquire uh, existing water rights. Um, so some of those farm water rights that we talked about, irrigated agriculture, those irrigation grandfathered rights can be extinguished. In other words, they can never be used again for irrigating and convert it into a water right that is useful for that certificate of 100-year assured water supply. But it doesn't create a new draft to the aquifer. Um, we also, as a community, <clears throat> recharge our reclaimed water. 
So all of that water that goes um, down the drain in everybody's house gets treated uh, to a high standard, and Neil will come talk about how that's done. And that reclaimed water, once it's clean, we recharge um, the aquifer with it. We store it in that vacant pore space above the groundwater table that we talked about. Picture in the bottom there are a couple of our uh, town recharge projects, uh, some basins and an in-channel project that we use to recharge the aquifer. And also we have uh, water that we're working on to come from the Big Chino. Conservation is very important for our community. And uh, this chart points out that uh, it's a comparison of uh, groundwater pumping to population growth. And as you can see, our groundwater pumping has not increased in uh, since about the early 2000s, um, but we've been able to increase our population by about 50%. So it's a 50% increase in population without increasing uh, groundwater withdrawals. That's conservation. People, just so, just so they understand, conserving water doesn't mean that that conserved water can be used for new growth. That means that water stays in your aquifer for a longer period of time. It will not be used uh, for new subdivisions. And just another way to look at uh, overall um, groundwater use or, or, or water use per person per day in Prescott Valley. Um, we've been down at around 100 gallons per person per day. It's one of the lowest use rates of a full service community in the state. Kudos to our citizens, they're, they're great at conserving water. And by the, by the way, they do that without draconian government measures. I just wanna point that out. It's an incentive-based program, it's based off of a tiered rate structure um, that, that charges more for more water use. So it's a good program. Uh, kind of already covered this. Uh, we store water in that bake vacant pore space above the uh, water table. Um, we do that. When we do that, the Department of Water Resources gives us credit, and we're allowed to withdraw those credits from another location, uh, and that allows us to provide water uh, for growth uh, without impacting the, the groundwater supplies because it's a different type of water. It's a different source of water. Um, <clears throat> you as a town council back in 2007 gave us a, a direction on those credits that we're accumulating. And you wanted to make sure that those water supplies weren't allocated out to uh, new developments based off a political process. You wanted it to be transparent, you wanted it to be fair, and you wanted it to be market driven. So in 2007, uh, Mayor Skoog ran a public auction, first of its kind, and I think about the last of its kind, um, public auction for water credits. And what you auctioned was a piece of paper that allowed access to water. So it wasn't wet water, it was, it was basically a title to the water. Um, so it moved away from a public, uh, a political process for allocating water and established markets for water in our area, very significant. It's, it was so significant that just a very small article in the Associated Press got picked up by a, a global water organization called Global Water Intelligence, and they nominated the town of Prescott Valley for a water deal of the year. And for some reason or another, they got Larry Tarkowski, your town manager, um, passed Homeland Security measures and out of the country um, <laughs> into London um, and where he received the, the award from uh, uh, Muhammad Yunus. Pardon me? And they let him back. Yeah, the most surprising thing is they did let him back. And, and, and who else snuck through with him? <laughs> and not without a story when they came back on how they got back. So Well, he sat there laughing while we were leave, trying to get out of uh, Great Britain. And they found, see that, uh, that crystal piece of thing that I'm hanging on to? That shows up on an x-ray as being a solid block. And then when you've got your cell phone wires in your suitcase underneath it, oh. it got their attention and they were very nervous. And the whole while Johnson was <laughs> laughing as more and more security people came up to the X-ray machine. Ultimately, they figured they were safer with him out of the country than in the country. And you. <laughs> 
this mean that uh, he's very affluent? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, I won't comment on that. Uh, <laughs> spelled with an E. <laughs> so, um, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get through the rest of this uh, relatively quick, I think. Um, we haven't had a lot of uh, back and forth questions, so it's moving a little faster than it normally does. Um, so our, our Big Chino Water Ranch, that's an imported supply. I'll show a map in a second. Uh, that's a significant source of new water for our community. It allows us to meet uh, needs for economic development, and it allows us to reach safe yield in the AMA. Uh, we joined uh, um, created a partnership with the city of Prescott back in 2004, bought a water ranch. I'll show the location. Um, and uh, we're basically the junior partner in that in that uh, endeavor, 46% share of the water, 46% share of the costs. Um, and we have a water right that's identified in state statute for 8,068 acre feet of water. Um, there in the middle of the map, the red polygon shows the uh, location of the Big Chino Water Ranch. And if I can get... Well, I apologize, I was trying to get a cursor going there so I could point. Um, but uh, as you can see on the map, I'll just uh, describe it verbally. Um, town of Prescott Valley is down in the kind of the southeast corner of the map. Uh, we'd build a, a series of pumps uh, on the water ranch and pipelines and pumping plants to bring the water into Prescott Valley. Uh, similarly with uh, the city of Prescott. Um, the joint project ends in Prescott Valley and we would split pipelines there. So the, the um, water supply didn't just come out of um, kind of the sky, I guess. Uh, it wasn't just invented as a water grab. It really has its origins way back to the early 1900s when the Central Arizona Project was envisioned uh, as a source of supply for Arizona so that Arizona could, could, could grow and kind of compete among the states as an economic uh, powerhouse among the states rather than kind of the dusty desert. Um, community, uh, you know, outpost it was prior to that. Um, so as part of the Central Arizona project, the city of Prescott and the Yavapai Prescott Indian tribe actually received allocations to a canal that provides water to Phoenix and Tucson only. Uh, the idea was that they would somehow make their uh, allocation wet by withdrawing it directly from the Verde River and trading the allocation to somebody downstream on the Verde River. Ultimately, that wasn't feasible, and so the water right was basically converted into what we now call the water rights to the Big Chino groundwater basin. Now, um, and it's also significant to note that the Arizona Department of Water Resources confirmed, it's not just our estimates, uh, the state agency confirmed in several reports that the Big Chino groundwater supply is necessary for us to reach safe field in this groundwater basin. So it's very important to us. Just wanted to point out, um, that's a little picture of the uh, water ranch kind of in its heyday. Um, it was an irrigated ranch. Uh, water supplies have been pumped for use uh, for irrigation uh, going back to the 40s, uh, early 40s, late 30s. So we're talking 80 years of pumping. It's significant to note that because all that pumping did not lower water tables at the location, nor did it impact the Verde River. And that's always been the assertion that future pumping will impact the Verde River. However, past pumping has not done so. As a matter of fact, past pumping hasn't even lowered the water table below 30 feet below the surface. Water supplies there in that basin stretch from 30 feet below ground to 2,500 feet below ground. It's a huge source of water. Nonetheless, we agreed that uh, being responsible uh, to the environment uh, and to our citizens who are concerned about the Verde River, um, that uh, we entered into an agreement with the Salt River Project. And this is a solid agreement ratified by the parties and uh, viewed by the state legislature in order to get our water right, that uh, we'll make sure our pumping doesn't impact the stream, even though the stream's 20 some miles away. 
It's also important to note that um, that's a standard we agreed to. It's also important to note that all the standards that apply to us here in the active management area follow us out to the Big Chino. And I'll explain why I say that uh, in the next segment. So all that being said, we're held to a standard in this state beyond any other community. No other community has to meet the standards for environmental protection that we do. No other community has to reach safe field without a subsidized, federally subsidized water source like we do. We're, we're held to the highest standard. Um, no other water users outside of our active management area are held to that same standard. So that being said, um, I'd like to open it up to questions if it's the mayor's prerogative. Questions, anyone? Mar Marty? I do. Two questions. Well, first a comment. Uh, I'm always interested in when you present a, a water program to us, uh, I always learn something new every time. So it's always good to see you making these presentations. Uh, first question is the presentation that you made tonight, is that available to anybody on the uh, town website? Um, we certainly can put it on the town website. The information in general is on the website, but okay. I mean, as long as the basic information is is available to them, yeah. so. And I totally forget what I was going to ask. <laughs> so that's an age issue, John. Any other? My, uh, Laura Lee. Then I'll oh, Laura Lee. It'll come to me. Don't worry. John, I'd be very interested. What? <clears throat> was give me a synopsis of the questions and concerns the citizens had as you went around. Were they similar? Did anything stand out to you? And I've learned, we've all learned, they have an attitude coming in. What was the attitude leaving? Those are my three questions. I think, I, um, thank you, Vice Mayor Nye. I think that was the most significant um, uh, thing that, uh, that uh, I took away from it. Um, Many people came up to us afterward and uh, thanked us for providing um, some clear, straightforward information. Um, they had not heard this. Uh, there are fear purveyors um, throughout our area who want people to be afraid of water supplies running short because they have an ulterior motive, whether it's to stop growth or something else. Um, so they had not heard a, a clear statement about our water supplies. Uh, they were surprised about many of the things, such as the 100-year assured water supply program, the fact that new growth is not allowed uh, to um, create a new draft on the aquifer, <clears throat> um, and that there's a state agency out there that is overseeing, you know, what we do. It's not really impacting the individual water user, but us as water suppliers have to answer to the state agency and meet all of these requirements kind of on behalf of the, you know, group of citizens we serve. Mr. Mayor, I remember my question. Uh, who, who does the monitoring to make sure that we adhere to these standards? Um, a, a whole bunch of folks. Um, we're required to provide annual reports on uh, everything we do, um, whether it's uh, the amount of water we pump and serve, uh, the amount of water we recharge, um, all those sorts of things, including water quality, which goes to a different state agency, Department of Water Re uh, Environmental Quality. So we provide uh, reports based on our monitoring, um, but they also look over our shoulder. Um, they see what we're doing. They have hydrologists and field specialists that come up and do their own monitoring of the groundwater basin on wells that they've established. Uh, we have one of the most um, uh, highly monitored groundwater basins in the state based off of the number of locations that groundwater is, groundwater information is collected at. So it's a, it's, it's a variety of uh, people that are doing the monitoring. Good, any other uh, question, Mike? Yeah, you brought up something that uh, was interesting to me, and again, we learn something every time you make a presentation, but uh, the water that's traded to demonstrate their 100-year uh, water supply, that can only occur within the AMA? Uh, that's correct, yeah. The water rights can't move outside of the active management area boundaries. 
So. Okay. Yeah, that's something I wasn't aware of. So it doesn't narrow, I think, the uh, ability of developers in terms yes. of how they right. utilize that. Yeah. Good. So. Other questions? Anything, uh, Jody? Uh, Mayor, I just want to ask, John, when we do have our citizens who want more information and maybe they're not able to attend a session, is there one place that we can direct them to? Here's the basic information to help you with that information. Um, yeah, well, it's it's hard to put everything together in one location, um, but we do kind of have a general um, format. Uh, there's a newsletter uh, that we put together that contains kind of a Water 101, um, and that can be found on our Upper Verde Coalition website, which is uh, yavapaiwatersmart.org. Good. Any other questions, comments? John, good job. We appreciate that. Thank you, Mayor. Now we're going to keep you up here, John. Yes. Number five, discussion, town participation with Federal Energy, Energy Regulatory Commission for Big Chino Valley Pumped Storage Project 12-12-17. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Um, this was a uh, application and an opportunity to intervene with the process uh, that popped up uh, with, without the opportunity to bring it to you first. The timelines were uh, too short. We had to have our application, uh, our motion to intervene submitted yesterday, so we weren't able to bring it to you. So based off of uh, um, town attorney's advice, um, we're notifying you of our activities regarding this and kind of give you some background on it. So as we understand it, uh, the company called Big Chino Valley Pump Storage Project, LLC, is attempting to install what's called a pump back storage project to generate um, off-peak uh, off electricity, uh, or maybe peaking electricity, I guess, is, is more appropriate, um, from a, a series of hydraulic turbines. Um, and they would uh, initially, I'll just give, kind of give you background here. So you saw this map uh, a little bit before. So what they want to do is install reservoirs on the cliffs. Um, they're south of Seligman, those purple uh, pentagons there, with an upper reservoir and a lower reservoir. They want to fill these reservoirs with about 19,000 acre feet of water. And then when electricity is required on the grid, they would run water from the upper reservoir through turbines generating electricity, collect it in the lower reservoir. When uh, uh, electricity is cheap and demand is low, they would pump the water back up. But they need to initially fill those reservoirs with water and then um, keep up with evaporation losses from those reservoirs over time. So their proposal is to install pumps virtually uh, right next door to our investment in our Big Chino Water Ranch uh, to, to initially pump out 19,000 acre feet and then about, I think it was 2,000 acre foot a year to cover evaporative losses. We simply wanted to have standing in the case as the Federal Energy Regulatory Committee uh, goes forward in review of the, of the application. So that's what the motion to intervene does is basically gives us a foothold um, to make further statements in the case. And as I pointed out a few minutes ago in my other presentation, <clears throat> at issue is that uh, withdrawals virtually right next door to us are not required uh, to adhere to any regulatory structure. So any withdrawals we have within that uh, red polygon there, that big Chino water ranch, uh, have, to, have to meet all of the requirements of the Prescott Active Management Area groundwater basin as well as all the requirements of our agreement with Salt River Project regarding mitigation and possible impacts to the Verde River. However, you cross the boundary by literally a few feet and none of those regulatory authorities apply to you. So that, I guess, is kind of a summary of the issue of our concerns. We don't know where this is going. Um, this has been proposed before about five years ago and it just fizzled. Um, probably happened here again, but we wanted to be uh, in the midst and make sure that uh, our investment, our community's investment in that water ranch 
are not undermined by um, this scheme. Questions? Ready for questions, John? Yes, sir. Mike? Yeah, I was just wondering, private property rights don't come into play in terms of, you know, the third area that's right in the middle of the big chino. Um, well, it, in, outside of the active management area, the private property rights to groundwater are based off of um, what I summarized just calling the law the biggest pump. Yeah. Um, but that does not apply to our plans to withdraw water. Uh, we have very tightly managed withdrawals um, and, and through an expensive process, whereas right next door, um, it, it is a private property issue. Mm -hmm. And they, they currently have those rights. But it seems fair that people would adhere to the same standards in the same groundwater basin. So is that a, a factor of being in, in the AMA? If it was yeah, somewhere yeah, else? Be, it because be we're in an AMA and we're pulling water out to reach safe field, um, requirements of the AMA follow us out to our property. But that location is not in the AMA. It's outside of the AMA. Mm -hmm. So is this a, do you know who this group is? Is it a politically oriented or is it a private? I do, I do not know who the principals really? in the group yeah. are. Good. Eddie, Laura? Uh, since this came up before, you said about five years ago, do you have any information or knowledge about why it didn't go forward then? And paradoxically, why it's happening again if it didn't work before? Um, the, the best information um, that I could, and it's fairly speculative, so with that in mind, is that it's- Better it's, than no information. It's, it's based off of property, increasing property values for that ranch. Okay, so um, they so want to the, sell it and they want a high dollar. They want to increase entitlements gotcha. and, and, and thereby increase property values. Um, but we still have to be vigilant because when I was reading this, of course, I was boiling because of the volume. They'll, you know, want to pull it, as you stated here, two and a half times larger than that that our two communities. And it's just, it's just galls me. Uh, Jody, thank you, Mayor. So, John, how do we? How did we find out about this particular action, and how do we monitor again for the future to be aware so we can take action? Um, how, how we found out about it? Uh, it was at the urging of notification and urging of our partners uh, in the project, Salt River Project. Uh, they've been concerned about it. Uh, they. Uh, contacted us one day, uh, both Prescott and Prescott Valley, and said, hey, would you consider filing a motion to intervene? This is an important thing. We're, all, we're jointly putting a lot of money into making sure the Big Chino Water Ranch is a responsible pumping project. Um, and again, this has none of those requirements. Um, so they, they urged us to. Other uh, parties besides Salt River Project that have filed motions include uh, several Indian tribes, um, several other cities, and um, uh, a, a variety of parties. So a number of people are concerned about it. Good. Other questions? Larry, do you have a comment? No? I do. Rick? I do. Doesn't ADWR have any, any play in this thing? I mean, I would think they'd have some concern. Um, I, I don't know that they've um, expressed any concern yet. Uh, again, it's allowed within the state system. Uh, you know, outside of the AMAs, law of the biggest pump, as long as they adhere to some very, very basic requirements, much further below what we have to adhere to, um, they're not breaking state law by doing this. Hope Seawig breaks their doors down. Anybody doesn't understand that statement, I'll explain it after the meeting. <laughs> Good. Any other comments? You know, uh, John, years ago, and I don't know if my memory is correct on it. It seems to me you said the Big Chino has a natural recharge of about 30,000 acre feet a year. Is that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, the, the, that's the currently held belief. So if they, we took out 8,000 between us and Prescott, and they would use 19,000 at one time uh, withdrawal with 2,000 uh, annual. 
it doesn't seem like that would be a big drain on the. Uh, and and it, and it may be. It's it's not that we're that concerned about the drain on the system, as much as it is that it is so close to our water ranch, uh -huh. and that um, we're investing millions of dollars into a responsible uh, pumping project. Um, where um, somebody is allowed to go, and it's, it just highlights the situation that there's a double standard. Yeah. Uh, we're held to the highest standard, um, and everybody, you know, statewide looks at everything we do to make sure that everything we do is held to that high standard, and it comes with a cost to our citizens. Um, but then you go literally across the fence line, and there are no standards, and and that's a concern. Mayor. Uh, Rick? Well, not only that, but today they want to take 19000 What happens tomorrow when they want to take 50000 I mean, they just keep pumping until they, you know, until it runs out of water. I mean, there's no stopping something like that. And, you know, it's, I, th I think we did the right thing in, in jumping on top of this. I really do. Because um, it just baffles me how you can have one house with a restriction on how much water they can use and the next house has no restriction whatsoever sitting in the same town and that's basically what what you're saying ADWR has we have a restriction but the rest of Arizona can do whatever they want to do and I think that's crazy I understand they may not be breaking any laws but I think somebody needs their head examined because there ought to be a law, if there isn't. Equity yeah, is falling. Yeah, and there's, that's crazy. And, and, and long term, to, to protect our investment in that basin, yes. um, we need to be vigilant and we need to push towards a, a more common form of, of protections uh, throughout. I agree. Good job. Good. Any other comments? Anything else, John? No, sir. If there is no further comments, I would declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you, John. You've done a good job. Lieutenant, thanks for well guarding us. Bravo. Bravo. Hey, John, would you mind? See, the, see how fast you can do it?